recording. Okay, welcome everyone to the Select Board Short Term Rental Subcommittee meeting, June 4th. Call the meeting to order at 6 01 p.m. And Eric, I just want to confirm with you the meeting schedule moving forward. We have Thursday at six correct. in the trailer hybrid, correct? Yep. Yes. And then Tuesday, Thursday, Tuesday. Next Tuesday, the 11th, which is Zoom only, just like this. And then Thursday, the 13th, which is back in the trailer and hybrid. Thank you. You're welcome. Good. Um, I think we have all the invited members of this group on. Um, don't think we need to, uh, my select board colleague, Malcolm McNabb is here as well. And um, Devin from town council's office is here. Good evening. Hi, good evening. Is, uh, is John gonna be on tonight? Um, he is not intending to, unless there's okay. a better question for him. Okay. Um, we I saw the memo that you sent, Devin, on court cases. Um, we may refer to that at some point if necessary. Um, good. So thank you for being on. Good. And I think what we'll do tonight is we'll start with a what was in the packet, which was everyone, all three groups submitted some goals. And... Yes, Malcolm. Yes, I uh, apologize in advance that I have to leave around seven o'clock. Uh, but I, we have such a wise group here. I just want to make sure that uh, what I said yesterday, that we make our statements brief. We have a lot to go over in a short time. So uh, make sure that everybody has an opportunity to speak. Thank you. Sounds good. Thank you. So I think what we'll do is we'll start with um, going in alphabetical order again. Each group submitted goals and just have a quick chat about that. And then we'll move on to a wider discussion beginning where we left off last night on zoning. Does that sound good? And uh, I'll kick it over to either Ms. Benz or Mr. Peel for their just goals. Let's talk about what 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 was in the packet today, please. Okay. Um just trying to bring this up yep. on my screen. Does anybody do you want me to screen share charity yes, comments? Good. Good. Yeah. Hold on. I'm working with a new computer here and it's hard for me to give me one second. Everybody see my screen? Yes. Okay. Good. So here we go, charity. Okay, um, this is essentially what I read last night um, or delivered last night. Um, it's, we deal with property owners and lots, permitting all of every property owner to short-term rent in the customary Nantucket tradition, compliance with the recent land court decision and to reflect the mandates of, Nant uh, of Nantucket voters to prevent gutting 50 years of zoning protection, that's in particularly in residential neighborhoods. Um, we want to protect those neighborhoods against investor owned uh, short term rental exploitation. We want to preserve and promote the enjoyment of neighborhoods uh, currently protected by the zoning bylaw to secure resident quality of life pr priorities, prevent the hollowing out of residential neighborhoods. I mentioned that yesterday. Uh, incentivize long-term rentals, manage the residential neighborhood churn and gridlock that's caused by revolving door short-term stays, and that gets into the uh, minimum night contracts and uh, changes in occupancy, particularly during July and August. Uh, as a result of that, try to reduce infrastructure impacts and damage that result in increased real estate taxes. Mine have gone up 25% in the last three years. That is not in <laughs> the objectives. And reinforce the obligation we will have to protect Nantucket's fragile environment, the natural resources, and all of those things that attract visitors to the island who are the underpinning of our economy. 
Thank you, uh, Stephen or Stephen. Um, Tom, one quick thing. Yes, I'm please. just going to mute everyone who's not talking. Okay. So if, if you all of a sudden become muted, it's because I'm muting you. Uh Um, so sorry, who did you call? Uh, Stephen or Stephen. Okay. Uh, Tom, I think I'm going to skip repeating what I said last night and just say that okay. our goal here is to find a place of agreement where uh, not everybody's going to be happy and we're not going to be unanimous, but we could find something that makes sense for our community. Um, and I think we covered the covered it last night. Thanks. Okay. But just, just for uh, members of the public, um, what was in our packet uh, everybody submitted something and Stephen, you wrote, um, yeah. so yes, exactly. What's submitted, on the screen. Yeah. yeah. I submitted it in writing, but it's identical to what I read last night. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. Uh, anything to add, uh, Grant or Jim? Uh, Grant, would you like me to go? Yeah. But before you do, I just want to say that, you know, we have an or overarching goal and that is to create something that that will actually get a two thirds majority at special town meeting, um, you know, which is sort of a what good is what we're what good is what we're doing if we don't do that. OK, but Jim, take it away. Good point. And I think many of our goals are, are similar to uh, to charities, although in only uh, th there's only three of them, a little bit broader. Um, and of course, um, our way of trying to reach the goals may be quite different from what charities proposing. But our three goals, as I read last night, are protect the peace, unity, and integrity of neighborhoods and reduce neighborhood churn. We all know that's a, a major threat from certain STRs. Second, to protect the time-honored tradition of home rentals on Nantucket. And when we say time-honored, we know from analyzing it that the time-honored tradition of home rentals on Nantucket does not merely include accessory use. There are other quite time-honored forms of home rental on Nantucket that might have to be looked at in a slightly different way, but still can be limited quite effectively. And that's a real key, I think, here. We want to limit things quite effectively, but we're not sure that we can um, do that merely through the traditional uh, definition of accessory. We think that's just a little bit off-center from the, all three types of main types of time-honored uh, home rentals that we have identified. And finally, our third goal was to, of course, with uh, with charity, and I'm sure with Stephen, to discourage investor-only ownership of residential properties for use as STRs. We think there's good ways to do that, including by limiting the number of contracts in the high season. And we're really excited about trying to get a provision that will accomplish that. That's it. Thanks. Sounds good. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Grant. Okay, so... Last night, we left off at the end of the meeting on a discussion about zoning and specifically three types of zoning were generally spoken about at the at the end of the meeting, which were primary, meaning commercial is I, I, not, I don't want to do hard, not my definitions, but just generally conversation what we're speaking about. And, you know, any anybody who uh, who goes next, feel free to. Um, jump in and correct or 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 um, redefine. But as I saw it, there were three three types of general zoning uses that we were chatting about at the end. Primary, meaning commercial, limited, or like vacation type rentals, or and accessory. And I was thinking today and and speaking to a bunch of um, a bunch of folks um, about this that to be able to really drill down on that, that we need to define the who, meaning who is not allowed. And I think that in a lot of the discussions and reading some of the articles that that a lot of them are about limiting investor only, that that's that may be a goal that that or is a goal of of many of the articles. So I I think if if the groups would, maybe we can drill down a little bit on these three types that we were speaking about last night and then begin to define the who um, by two questions, meaning who can rent by who 
and how many per person? Because I think that will help define the three types or the types of zoning use. So I would sort of just open that up for discussion. Um, any of the groups want to apply that to their article or have any commentary on that or possibly lead in another area zoning? This is just my my um, my jumping off point from our discussion last night. So, Tom, I, I think that those are two of the big issues, um, but I think that um the, the 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 there's a lot of overlap on um how we could regulate zoning um or how we could re regulate strs that deals with more than one issue i don't know if it's quite sort of that simple but I, but i do think that the idea of trying to address general concepts um is a good idea um you know it, if you look at the the handout that that i circulated I tried to make a list of concepts that we could discuss, and you know, frankly, if we if we talk about what we might agree on, we might find that there's a lot of it. Instead of if we talk about what we don't agree on, um, and so I don't know if anybody has any interest in going through the list of concepts that I that I did, but it's you know the two that Tom suggested are on it, and I, I basically made that list by going through everybody's articles and identifying what are the concepts that everybody's doing. It's not just my uh, list. And I think that if we could say, okay, yes or no, we agree that we should be limiting the number of nights or the number of turnovers or who can do it or how many certificates you can have, that will help us uh, put a skeleton together that we can then put some bones on and then dress up and get some makeup and jewelry and keep going. Um, and I'd like to suggest that. Uh, Grant and then Jim. So <clears throat> I, I agree with Stephen that we could go through his list. We've done a similar exercise. I really appreciated getting his list today. Um, I'm a little bit reticent to name the who part, part of it because, and this is what I've always heard, is that zoning is about use. It's not about the people that we're trying to exclude. It's about it's about the use that we're trying to discourage. You know, we're not against gas station attendance, but if somebody tried to build a gas station across the street of my house, I would have something to say about it. So um, that's really what I wanted to say is, I you know, I'd be happy to go through yeah. Steve's list, but I, I worry I, about excluding I, I, people. I, I totally agree with that, Grant. I don't think that the point of zoning and or the of government is to pick the winners or losers, but I think that if we look at requiring certain uh, terms and features, that those will naturally uh, encourage or discourage certain things. So, for example, if you have a term that is hard to meet for an investor, you are discouraging investment. Um, so I think that we can't just say, no investor only, but we could put terms in place that would that would discourage investors or would be hard to meet for investors. Um, now, it would be helpful if those terms actually had a community benefit, um, but as opposed to just being a pretext. But uh, you know, if people want to go uh, through my list or if they have their own list, I don't I don't necessarily have any ego or pride of ownership. I was just trying to be helpful. Uh, I think that we would see that the things that are, that are on that those lists. If you pick certain features, you are then favoring certain uh, types of SDRs. Stephen, let me let me just clarify what what my thinking was. Just as a discussion topic was, so we did Article sixty, which had the corporate provisions in it, right? That's that's a part of the who. So then, getting to how many fills in a lot of the gaps. If the if the group wants to take it another way, it's just that I that was my thinking in a discussion. So I'm more than happy to run through Steven's list as a as a starting off point. Yes, Jim Jim. Jim, you're muted. Sorry. My apologies. I do like Steven's list. Um but I, I do want to say um that the number there's a few things such as the number that I think are very important. And, and I know for our group that um, one STR license per person 
whether it be a property or a dwelling, but one per person is, is a big part because we think it will limit overall numbers and also help with churn and also help to preserve neighborhoods. All those things we're talking about. Now, Stephen makes a great point that we're not trying to say this sort of person can't do this, but we're setting up criteria so it might not work, let's say, for an investor only person. In the same way, um, the number of contracts in high season, I think, is something we all recognize as a very, very important lever and, and one that can help, I think, to weed out investor-only STRs. Um, now, having said that, I was just wondering um, if I could, if Tom, if you would feel it would be all right for me to give you the list of, we feel we have identified three time-honored traditions of home rental on Nantucket, which I think we all may agree uh, we would want to allow in this. Would that be something appropriate to bring up now, Tom, or should we wait on that farther downstream? Sure, and we can go on to Stephen's list after that, if that works. Okay, so and we made up this list trying to figure out if if all of them fit with just the traditional accessory and we think the first one might but we're not sure if the others do so the first example we have the first prototype we have is a year rounder owns and lives on a principal residence property and rents all or a portion of it um, up to six times in july and august sorry it's not on our, our sheet erica and and rents of all or a portion of it up to six times in july and august in addition to shoulder season rentals. Now, this is the one type of traditional um, time-honored rental on Nantucket, and I do think the charity really recognizes that, and I, and I uh, applaud her for that. It's very important. But we see two others that are also time-honored on Nantucket. One is a year-rounder or someone else, but is owner of a separate property, not maybe not their principal residence, and they rent all of that up to six times in July and August, and maybe in shoulder seasons. These are the people who have bought a, a, a rental property. They use it to pay for their kids to go to college. I, I was one of those people for a while. They use it maybe to pay for retirement, for their uh, retirement home for their parents. They use it to build for their own retirement. This, however, might not fit in the traditional definition of accessory because they may not live in it longer than they rent it. And yet it is a part of the time-honored tradition of Nantucket rentals. And then third, I'll try to keep this quick. Third is a seasonal owner, a summer person, whatever we want to say, those, these people who are so incredibly important to our community for the, the, the riches of culture and, and, and of everything else, personality that they bring to our island, they may rent their property from uh, longer than they are able to come. And yet they keep it in their family. There's many generations that are doing this. And, and I think we, we cherish these families. They would not fit under the, uh, probably would not fit under the uh, uh, traditional definition of accessory use. Now, we think those three do fit and need to, and we need to have regulations that honor them. And I think we feel that our group has done that. Now, the, the fourth type we don't think any of us want to see investor only. They don't have a connection to Nantucket. They're by it for financial reasons. We hope we can use uh, strategies like what Stephen mentioned, number of contracts, to try to discourage that from happening. But we also think we need to have um, a strategy, a series of strategies that will protect those time-honored uh, traditions of Nantucket rental. So thank you for letting me say that. Um, yeah, you know, Jim, I think that the three categories that you laid out are both correct and likely cover more than 95% of short-term rentals on Nantucket. Um, and, I, and I think it's important for us to focus on rules that are fair to those people um, and, you know, potentially discourage the other 5% or whatever it is w without making rules targeting the 5% that, that overburden the 95%. Um, so, and I do think that we can do that. Okay, so Stephen, your list is is start is the STR regulation topics on your three pages here, right? Yes. With that requirement for providing contact, that that start with that. That yeah, and and, and I I think start. and I think Tom the, the the way I would suggest going through it is to just go as shallow as we can on where we get to agreement. And if we get to a point where we 
okay, some people, so for example, if, if we all agree that there should be a limited number of contracts, but we don't agree on the number, let, let's get to where we can agree and try to, you know, like, and then move on. So we can try to, establish, I'd like to try to see if we can establish that there are a dozen or more areas of agreement before we start negotiating where the, you know, if it's six contracts or eight contracts or whatever. Um, that That's my suggestion to try to move sort of shallow through the list and find all the areas of agreement. I see. Uh, Malcolm. Tom, can I just want to interrupt Malcolm for one second? Um, I just wanted to point out that Charity's had her hand up for quite some time. Oh, I missed it. The um, conversation is kind of getting driven by two people. And I'm going to lower Kit Murphy's hand yep, because we're not accepting public comment. Oh, I was, okay. I just got here. Charity, I did not see your hand. It was in the corner. Um, so I apologize. Well, I Please. I to switch computers in the meantime. I think it, I I like what Jim is suggesting. And I, I think that those are the three categories. Um, most likely categories, and, and I probably can agree that they represent a very high, collectively, a very high percentage of the um, of the STRs on island. Um, but I, in order to speed things up a little bit, I think we, you know, if you want to pick a subject, let's do it. Let's pick uh, turnovers, or let's pick minimum nights. Let's, you know, keep going on these things and try to run through them. Uh, go go back and forth between the people who are have proposed these articles, and let's see if we can get someplace. Sounds good. So I th I think we can just jump off on the on these topics right now. Um, number one is add requirement for for providing contact information for the rental intermediary. Is that a good place to start? Oh, Malcolm. Tom, I, Tom, I think you're in the regulations, not the zoning. Oh. Apologize. Yes, absolutely. Malcolm, please. Uh, I, I think Charity said, <clears throat> I just wanted to make sure that uh, Charity or other groups got to uh, participate in this because it was getting a little two-sided. That's all. Agree. All right, I'm gonna lower Malcolm and Charity's hands for the time being. And did you want me to pull up Stephen's concept list? Yes, please. That would be helpful. All right, hold on. Jesus. Everybody see that? Yes. Okay. Can you make it a little bigger? How's that, Grant? Okay. So should we just go group by group um, through each provision? And everyone has a chance to, to weigh in on number one and so forth. I think that might be a good way to do it. Um, it seems where we left off last night. OK. Um, so let's do alphabetical order. Charity, I'll, I'll let you start on um, your thoughts on number one. Okay, um, adding, uh, when you say STRs, I suspect that you're referring to accessory STRs. Uh, uh, just, a, just a very general concept of an STR. I think our position on that is essentially, and I'm, I, I have to uh, say that uh, we are not in, any way uh, interested in putting a Y in the uh, in the columns, um, but we are interested in restricting or providing um, guide uh, guardrails for limited use. And um, as I said, accessory use, not just STRs. Our 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 article is an accessory use articles article and. We're sticking to it. Steven? Uh, yeah, I mean, if you look at this list, there are zero details in it. They're only topics. And uh, I think that Stephen Morey's idea last night of having 
a broad category of STR that is essentially prohibited in all districts and a more limited definition of STR is that that is in line with what you know Jim said a few minutes ago um, is, is that could be an allowed use is probably a successful uh, way to do it that works within the zoning code the way the zoning code works um, and so I think that we just uh, I think there was some consensus last night that nobody wants unlimited STRs that everybody wants some well-regulated limited STRs and that the, and that they seem to be okay with those being in any district except CI. Um, and I'm not saying that we had an agreement on that, but we we seem to be going in that direction. Um, so that's that's where I think we are. Grant? I agree with Stephen and, um, you know, it, our group, and I'll, and I'll let Jim sort of fill in the blanks for me, but our group feels strongly that um, we need to allow STRs under some label, um, but limit them in, in meaningful ways, in reasonable ways. And um, I just don't see any way, as Jim said, because of the traditional uses that we have on the island for decades, I just don't see any reason, way to do that as a pure accessory use. So creating a new definition of what we're trying to regulate, what we're trying to limit, what we're trying to get a hold of makes a lot of sense to me. Jim, am I missing anything? That sounds good. That sounds, uh, yes, Charity. I just want to mention that uh, we need to be mindful of the fact that the voters in May um, did not welcome the idea of a Y in the use chart for short term. Um, God's sakes. And, I, I, and so I think that while we want to try to figure out guardrails, we have to be mindful of that particularly if you're trying to get to two thirds. Grant. Yeah, I I agree with Charity that a lot of people at town meeting don't want to, didn't want a Y in the use chart in the context of article 59. However, in the context of this meeting and of the special town meeting, Y and A are really just letters on a chart. What we're trying to do is create something that we can regulate and it's very hard to regulate um, short-term rentals as an accessory use without creating major hardships for people we've relied on on the island for decades so um, i i understand sticking to your guns but for the purposes of this exercise and coming up with a a compromise article I'm hoping that we can all pull together and make make edits to what we're putting out there. And if and if people don't like it, we always have the option of going back to our articles as written and um, and putting those forward at town meeting. And but I I really believe that special town meeting is going to vote very strongly for a compromise article because. The even the even Article sixty was about fifty fifty in the way that that people came down on it. There was a lot of disagreement there, so we need to bring people in from the margins um, to get them to to say yes to this thing. Can I suggest that you know, this is going to be a, a somewhat contentious issue, and I don't know that we're going to be able to move further along because we might get stuck here. Should we go on to some of the easier? Like, yeah, well, I, 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 Charity, I agree with you, but let me just sort of break it down into very simple concepts. Do you, do you agree that we should be prohibiting unrestricted STRUs? Yes, yeah, Stephen, I was just going to move on to your, your, yeah. in your list, your point A here. So that it's just stating what's in uh, on yeah. the list here. Prohibit STRs as an unlimited use. I, I think we all agree on that, right? Yes, I agree with that. Okay. And then we, I think we all agree that STRs as a limited use, if we could put the right rules in place, are okay. Right. 
Well, I, I would agree in that conceptually, if we were in a place that we could count on these rules being enforced. Okay. Grant or Jim? Yeah, I agree that that we it makes sense to have STRs in the zoning code because that's what the ZBA is really asking us to do, or act, that's what the judge is asking us to do. Um, and, but it has to be a limited use. And then point C, allow STRs in all zoning districts except X, which in, in this case is everything but CI. I can't agree with that. I mean, without um, much larger discussion. Okay. Well, in, in general, is there a district or type of neighborhood that you would want to see them not allowed? It's not a matter of them not being allowed. It's a matter of them not being allowed as a business or as anything outside the current zoning code of an accessory use. Okay, okay, but but I think you know if you look down the list, we get to all of the. If we come up with something that is a restricted enough STR use. Is there an area you don't want to see that? Well, I I can see that CI is a good place. But I don't okay. want to see them. I don't want somebody having a short term rental on on the uh, runway at the airport. Okay, so so in general, there's no objection to it being in any area except CI, even though there's not any agreement on whether it should be allowed until we get those terms, right? I can't agree to that until we get to the rest of this. Okay. That, okay, perfect. That's that's why we're going through this slowly. All right, Tom. Grant or Jim on uh, point C? Yes. Yes, we agree. Um, all zoning districts except CI. Correct. Any other comments on one before we move on to two and just sort of plow through this a little bit? Or does anybody want to um have anything more more granular on any provisions in their articles on that all right we'll move on to number two allow legacy rights for existing strs charity i cannot agree to that without guardrails or a sunset of some kind yeah, that that those are the two A and B. The A A is should it be should all STRs be have legacy rights or just some, and then if if there's any legacy rights, do those sunset? That's a possibility for us. Okay. Uh, I guess I would say if we're giving legacy rights to some people, we should give them to everybody. Uh, I'm open to hearing why that. There might be some we might want not want to give it to, but I think in fairness, it's not. You know, I don't think it's fair to pick and choose losers in that. In that, but I'm I'm open to hearing why why it might not be everybody. And and then in terms of sunset, I I don't generally agree that we should be sunsetting legacy rights, but it's certainly, uh, you know, I could see some value to it also. So, Grant or Jim? Grant, go, go ahead, Jim, and then I'll follow up. Okay, thanks. So um, I think our basic feeling on this is that we think that things like number of contracts per summer for July and August should apply to everyone, whether or not they've rented in the past. Um, we, and But we do believe that it should be one, one person, one STR. However, we believe there should be a legacy for people who set up their family finances by owning more than one STR and that that could have a sunset of perhaps five or 10 years or whatever the wisdom of the group determines. Grant? Yeah, that 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 sums up our, our group. And I just want to throw something else, else out there that is, that's not part of our article, but it's something to consider. And that is, um, so this is, I'm just talking for me personally, not for the members of my group who are going to beat me up after this, but I'm just going to say, I would agree to legacy provisions 
if we had a cap that was set at something lower than what we have today so that everyone could continue doing what they're doing, but we would have them fall away by attrition so that we could manage manage the the number that way, just so that we could have a better sense of what's going on and and um, you know when the registry is is spewing out data, then we'll be able to figure out okay how do we adjust the cap. But we're not really talking about a cap right now, so I I'm not going to talk further about that. So I okay. think I think my question to the group would be in Grant and Jim's article they have a sunset provision of five years. How does how does the group feel about that in general, Stephen? I think you said you'd be open to it. Yeah, so talking about it at least. Yeah, is if I heard Grant and Jim correctly, it, they seem to be open to the idea of legacy provisions for the number of licenses or number of properties, as opposed to following other rules. Which I That's which I agree with that that nobody should be exempt from some of the other rules. But the but the numbers is something we should talk about. Um, right. So so if they're open to giving that to everybody, but want to also have some sunset provision in it there's probably some reasonable way to get there. Um, I don't I don't know that the legacy has to be forever. Charity? I think some of this boils down, I mean, I think that what Grant and uh, Jim have proposed in terms of uh, limiting the number of licenses, let's put it that way, and um, could be workable, but I don't think the whole idea of having one family own five or six dwellings and trying to manipulate the ownership of those dwellings to call them legacy properties and that sort of thing is acceptable. So I think if you if you couple the, you know, some adjustment or some concession or maybe one uh, extra dwelling and then have a sunset, which I would say could not be more than five years and probably should be a lot less, uh, unless, you know, there's some hardship involved. You know, I think that could be worked in, but not for five or six family homes. That's a great. So, wait, so, Jerry, yeah, you... Oh, allow me, Stephen, and then, and then I'll throw it back to you. Right. Um, so... According to our one of our members, Tom Dixon, the number of of people that have five or six family homes is is low. It's it's not a gigantic number. I think 4%, there's four percent. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so these are just these are, and I you know I have to ask the the lawyers in the group if they want to jump in and say, okay, how long does it take? to write a trust to figure out ownership of property so that somebody can get their houses in order and and stay within the letter of the law for this for this bylaw. Um, we're just trying to give people an opportunity to do one of three things. Dispose of their property and take, you know, and pay their capital gains tax and all that stuff. Um, figure out whether they want to divide their property between a husband and a wife. And if they have more than that, then create uh, trusts for their kids so that their kids can be the beneficiaries of those trusts and, and have a, a college education, which, you know, if anything's rising as fast as the cost of housing on Nance, okay, it's the cost of college education. So um, th those that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to make it easier for people, not harder. Jim, I mean, I'm sorry, Stephen. So I guess what I would say is if we're only talking about legacy provisions for the number of properties or certificates you can have, um, I would I think that that should be essentially unlimited because these are people who made decisions under certain economic you know, situations and rules, and now we're changing the rules on them. And I think it's very unfair to, to do that. And I think that one of the reasons why it's not so bad to do that is that it's such a low percentage of what we're talking about here. You're talking about 4% of the uh, current STRs would be over that limit. And, and obviously those would die off. If we had a 10 year provision for, for sunsetting, I could probably go with that. And if we're, and if we're debating later, whether it's five years or 10 years, I think we have a, a great victory. 
Um, so, you know, I would suggest that a, a legacy provision on the number you can have with a with a sunset of somewhere between five to 10 years might be a good placeholder for now. I would also note that I think if I if I understand Charity and um, Matt's article correctly, they do have a legacy provision for cottage colonies and it's unlimited. Is that correct? No, that's been removed. That was removed in the final article. Okay. Um, I I actually think cottage colonies should have, and everybody should have well, a uh, a um, some kind of ability. Exemption. To, you know, exemption, mm -hmm. yeah. This, these were pre-1972, and um, Mr. Giorgio advised us to remove them. So, well, what was that? Mr. Giorgio advised us that that was not necessary because there are other means for those people to seek relief. So, okay, that I, I think that's that's a little cute because you're saying you're not having a grand uh, a legacy provision in the article because they already have. So you want to provide well, legacy well, provisions. It, it, you know, it's just not necessary to put it in because there are other forms of relief. I, right, but in reality, even if I if I may about... if I may real quick, the short term rental work group was advised, and I think Jim um corroborate this that 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 needed to be in well, the protections needed to be in there for cottage colonies. Yes. Um yeah. Yeah. So I would I, I, I don't whether it's whether it's in there or it's by whether it's in the rule or it's just a legal truth. I think having legacy provisions for some people, but not others, makes me really uncomfortable because essentially all of these people made decisions based on the facts on the table at the time they made those decisions. And that's why legacy is is generally uh, in there. So, OK, so I'm going to make a note of that to sort of put in our. Um our you know, parking area, if you will, for other ideas is something yeah. that needs to be figured out later. So to get back to the bigger co uh, topics, sure. I think that's something that, that, that well, if, if Devin, if you want to weigh in on that, if, if you know anything or we, we, that we can just hold that until later, it's, I think it's probably better if we just hold it, anything like that, that's a subtopic, we can hold it for um, a later date. Yeah, I think, I think that's good, Tom. I don't think we need to like get caught in any of the okay. details on these tonight. okay sounds good so it sounds like there is some some consensus on a sunset provision depending on other regulations in the zoning bylaw i, sure. I, th I think that's good yes and so i think we'll move on to number three which is limit the number of strs per person by certificate of registration or by property Charity? I think we could um, consider that. We do not have it in our article, but we'd be happy to consider it. Our, so, our, our article is addressed to all property owners. Stephen? So uh, I think that what, what, I, what I would like to see is that people can have essentially their own property and one investment property. Um, there is a number of ways to get there, but that's the concept I would go for that you could. And, and the reason is, is that people often have both often deal with their own property and then have like a, either an investment property or a family property or an inherited property. Um, and I don't think that we are talking about investor only conglomerates. If you can have up to, Two properties, um, so that's where I would probably cap it as some kind, uh, some some cap in the two property range. Stephen, if I, if the group will allow me to kind of think out loud here for a second, so something that came up many times at the short term rental work group was that there are a lot of different, many many different ownership scenarios on Nantucket, and getting them all in our articles was very difficult and so what we were advised to do was to create some kind of we were calling it a hardship committee but some kind of um if it didn't fit into one bucket or didn't wasn't covered by the cottage colonies or the timeshares etc that it would go to a 
um, a board. So if or or a group of a body that maybe was appointed by the select board or something like that. Yeah. If it if the if the number of STRs per person was say one, and there was a hardship provision for another in certain cases, like say one one is something somebody brought up to me again. Just I'm kind of thinking out loud here, is that say you had um say you had a husband and wife wife passes away husband owns the property but they also own the property next door so it's 28 and 30 x road and they want a short-term rental both but it's only in one person's name it, it, is that a case for a hardship right that's not investment that's not investment that may be that may be a case but the one the the core of the one registration would still be intact or the one license. Does that make sense? Yeah, it, it does. And I do think that they're having a hardship provision uh, makes a lot of sense, especially when you're dealing with death. Um, but I, I, I guess what I would say is in general, if, if a single person had two properties, I think that's not outside the bounds of either what currently happens. And I don't think it falls into the investor only you know nightmare whereas okay, I so i would i would say that that you know i'm sure that my number is the outside number but i would go with two properties you know and i'm sure that people want less charity I think, one, I think one is good and then hardship on the other if you want to do it that way jim well, or grant, grant did you want to take grant, this? you had your hand up yeah, I you know, uh, our group has always said that it's one per property. And then where we would be flexible is if somebody owned a property with two dwellings on it, maybe they could have two, two contracts for that single property. Um, that might be a good, good compromise. Um, it's just that uh, if you make it two per person, you're kind of discriminating against uh, single people, you know, because two per person that means a a fam uh, a husband and wife can own can own four, um, and so wh why not just make it one per person? And I agree with the idea of a hardship committee. Um, you know, it's it or you know some kind we would need to create some kind of point system like the um, like the the sewer the sewer commission has where you know you have a certain number of years left on your mortgage and you and you have kids in college and you you know you need to put your parents in um, a memory care facility those are those are real hardships and um and sometimes that money comes in really handy especially on Nantucket but that's where we netted out Jim, did you want to say for something? clarification grant are you saying one sort of dwelling per person or one property per person one lot per person and if the yes. lot has a second dwelling then th yes. then somebody could have one or two contracts so so it, if, if that was the case i don't think that we're actually that far off because if i right. because you're saying a married couple or a couple they have to be married but a couple could essentially have two properties right one they live Correct. in or, and one they rent out and that's relatively, that's essentially what I'm looking for is people to be able to have a property that they live in and they might rent, but also to have an investment property, but not four or five. Um, so I don't, I think that we're close on that. We might not be a hundred percent, but. So I, I think Tom there, the issue is like two properties or less seems to be Okay. 1.5 properties. Um, I would say less than, I would say one property, but possibly two dwellings on one property. I, I, I think if we allow two properties per person, you have a family of three, suddenly there's six different properties in the family that are allowed to STR. And I, that just seems unwieldy. Doesn't seem yeah. right. So yeah, I, I uh, Jim, that's not where I'm trying to go either. So I think, I think that if we had a scenario where it was um, essentially that, that a couple could have, um, it, it kind of depends whether you do licenses or properties yeah. and we might have some combination of it, but essentially two, I would want to see it to be two properties also, not necessarily, um, 
you know, two for me and two for my wife and two for my kid. And, you know, yeah. but so where stuff. I think there might be a meeting point, Steve, is, is one property per person. But if that property does have two dwellings, perhaps those two could be rented separately. I think that might be a, a meeting point. Uh, perhaps that's where I would see the meeting point perhaps be. Yeah. With, without agreeing to it, I think that that's super close to what I'm talking about. So are you saying then a primary and a secondary? Is that what you're saying, Jim? If I guess you would define it that way. Absolutely, Charity. If they were on the same property, and I don't know how common that is. I know I know our, our numbers guy, Matt, Matt has figured all that out, and he, he's brilliantly there working on it now. But um, I don't think it's that huge a number. And I think it's it, it may, be, uh, may be reasonable. I think that there is a very large number of secondary dwellings. Now, whether how many of those are long-term rented or short-term rented is perhaps unknowable, but we should be able to know uh, the short-term rented. Sure. But I, I think that we could be uh, willing to discuss that further. One and one, whether it's, you know, one, if you have a secondary, but, but if you do that then, and somebody does not have a secondary dwelling, will they be prohibited from building a secondary dwelling and also having another dwelling? That's a great question. Yeah, is it an unintended consequence of it would this be, provision? It, I think it would be if we had a, a limit on numbers of contracts per summer for new, new pieces of property, I believe it would be limited in such a way that it might not be a, a good investment. So yeah, exactly. We have to write that very yeah. carefully. Yes, that's exactly right. Okay, so so just back to Grant or, or Jim, if you're a single person, that mm -hmm. person could have one property, right, with up to yes. two units, and if that and if there was a couple, regardless of whether they're married, they could then have another property. Well, they would each have right. one. Yeah, they could whether or not they're married, I mean, they're just okay. people, you know. Right. So it and doesn't. They, and it doesn't those two properties that, could have two second dwellings on them, so they could. They could potentially have four, but you know the number of properties with single dwellings on them is I don't, I, I don't know what the number is. I'm, I'm yeah, uh, gonna find I don't out. I don't like advantaging couples over single people, but rule our government governmental rules actually do it all the time. So um, right, but I think if I, whether or not they're a couple or they're not a couple, they still get one property each, so it, it doesn't really matter. Right. I mean, if they choose to share, you know, their lives in matrimonial bliss, that's great. And they can share yeah. property too, but they don't have to, they can just be people, you know? Right. How about if we put that in the parking lot for further distance? <laughs> okay. Well, I, I do think that, that there's some consensus that we're looking at a low number, right? I, sort of regardless of where we end up. I think we're in a, we're in a neighborhood there that said that nobody seems to be objecting to, you know, trying to get three or five or 10 or Right. And we seem to have covered point number four in this discussion as well. Yes. Well, I, I don't know about that because most lots would only have two per lot. But then, um, you know, in our um, legacy provision, are we are we exempting lots that have historically had more? Yes, I think we have to exempt cottage colonies. I think it's the only, we were told, as Tom mentioned, the, it was the only fair way to deal with them. Yeah. They must be their own entity. Yeah. If we're going to do that, I would exempt properties that have, that have had more than, that have more than three legal dwellings that are not prohibited dwellings, which are going to, which is an extremely small number, but it's essentially we have three dwellings that predate 1972. Any. Okay, I'll put that in the parking lot, um, yeah. co college colonies, and the like. Yeah, um, and the like. Right. Mm -hmm. Properties properties where the dwellings predate, the, where the third dwelling is a legal, you know, is not a prohibited third dwelling, like where we're, you know, others. We, we can, you know what I mean. Um, again, just to be fair. It's going to take quite a while to thread these needles, and no. you're, you're, you're demonstrating that right now. There are many, many provisions, and not sure that we're going to be able to get this done in the time we have. So, Charity, I have actually full faith that we could do it. I really do. Well, if everybody keeps talking, uh, we'll we'll see. Hope so. So, does anybody have anything else on four? 
I think we kind of covered it. Nope. nope. Okay. Five, limit the number of STR leases on one property at a time. Charity, or Malcolm. Malcolm, then Charity. Malcolm, you're muted. Thank you. Uh, I have to leave all you wise people, but I want to leave you with a couple of thoughts. The short-term rental working group proposal, a lot of the reasons it was defeated was extremely complicated and we're starting to get complicated. Also, whatever we ultimately come with is going to have to be enforced. And John and his, his people are going to have a very hard time if it's too complicated. Make it simple. Make it simple. At least the start. We can change it later, but please, simple 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 thank you all thank you you're welcome thanks Malcolm. see ya uh charity on number five uh the number of short-term rental leases on one property at one time um i think grant and jim's uh, article cover that as long as they are to the same renter is that correct jim that's what we had at in that article yes yeah and i think that makes sense as long as i think there was an issue even yesterday about whether or not the the renter or the, the signatory has to be the same for both dwellings and mm -hmm. i think that was i don't think we got to a, an agreement on that did we I think we thought basically that if it's from the same family, of course, it's fine. But, you know, that those are difficult little issues. It's true. But they can be parking lot issues. Okay. Our yeah. article says one dwelling at a time. Uh, in other words, if there are two, two dwellings, primary and secondary, we say one at a time. But I think that we could move on that and uh, towards Jim's and Grant's position. Okay, so Steven? The, I, I think there's consensus that if the houses that were rented together, essentially, that that would be fine, right? That would be considered one use. Um, I actually think it's fine to have the houses rep rep uh, rented separately, and I would probably handle that under the number of contracts, but um, we can uh, put a pin in that too. Um, I don't think it's the hill to live or die on. I don't know. Stephen, do you have, Maury, do you have a opinion on that one? Stephen? No, no, I don't think this should be a sticking point for us. Yeah, so. I Could I just add one thing? I think Stephen's point about the number of contracts is apt. And um, that could be quite a deterrent uh, to doing some kind of short-term um, rental in the middle of the summer if that's going to use up, eat up one of their turnovers. So I think yeah. that's an interesting concept. So I would, I, I, my, my thought, just to piggyback that, is I would probably limit the number of contracts. And if people want to rent the houses separately and, you know, use up all their contracts quickly, I might be okay with that. But that, that presumes that the number of contracts is assigned to the property. And not right. to the certificate. Right. It's true. <clears throat> so we can we can you know look at look look at this as we go. All right, Tom. Jim or Grant, do you have anything on that? Anything else? Yeah, I I just wanted to mention that um, uh, as a group we talked about this a lot, and um, we came down on the side that it really doesn't matter whether a single property has two contracts on it or one. Because if it has two contracts on it, those two parties are self-policing. They're going to be living close to each other. They're going to be keeping the noise down for one another um, because nobody wants to rat on their neighbor in that situation. But if, if you have one party with a lot of people in two dwellings you know, the, and a pool in between them, then maybe you have a real big noise problem. So maybe two contracts might be a good thing in that in that. Contest. Yeah. 
that's that's interesting that actually breaking it up might be better than having you know 15 people staying on the, on a, a state charity anything on that no uh, parking lot i think that's worth a further discussion and thought i don't think we can make decisions just on the fly like that but i think okay it's, it's an interesting use of a contract got it so number six limit the number of str leases per year limit in july and august limit outside july and august different number of leases or waiver for x uh let's let's start with let's just start with the bigger concept which is limit the number of str leases per year agree yeah i think we all agree on that okay july and august how's it charity agree Jim Grant or Stephen? Uh, agree, yeah. We agree, but granted, we agree on the number of leases per year because we we do we we feel we we should be strict in July and August. But in the shoulder season, we mentioned an unlimited amount because we we are trying to encourage the shoulder yeah. season on Nantucket. That, and that's right. the next one. That's B. Yeah, yeah. So 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 C is really the uh, excuse me. B is really the sounds like there's consensus on A. Yes. And, yes. Um, if just, we're talking about if we're talking about turnovers versus contracts, so yeah. I, yes. I think we ought to be limiting the number of turnovers in July um, and August. And, and limit you know, outside number, July and August, we may not agree on. I don't know. Yeah, the number we liked was was six for existing short term rentals and and four for newcomers in July and August. In July and August, right? Yeah. What is the purpose of C? So um, uh, let me let me add some color there. Um, you know, I would generally say on A that we all agree that there should be a limit of the number of turnovers in July and August. Um, I think that Grant and Jim and I and Stephen agree that we should not be limiting outside of July and August. And I think the charity's position is uh, that you should. But sort of regardless, um, to answer your question, uh, w our group had an idea that you might have a different number of contracts based on how long you've owned your property. So for example, if you've owned the property for three years or five years or something, you get a larger number of contracts than, than when you first buy it. And the intent there is essentially to make it uh, less contracts for new buyers, which uh, if you're an investor and you can only get four or five contracts, but a uh, someone who's owned their property for three years or five years can get you know more, then it, it discourages the investor only by making them wait to get to a higher level. That was the concept. Um, and then also you know, the that's idea, a... the, there's also an idea of if you wanted to grant any kind of waivers for, um, I know owner occupied doesn't pass the com the commerce clause, but for you know off season use or whatever. That's a, an interesting, interesting idea that we would definitely entertain because the reason we wanted to have X number of, of turnovers for newcomers was to um, discourage investors uh, short term rentals. But if if that were coupled with, you know, the, the requirement that they spend a certain amount of time in the community, then both of those conditions could go away if those people over time became members of the community or became, you know, they started to care about the island in that way. I think, you know, I think we have to remember what Malcolm said. I mean, this is an, a, an entirely new concept. I, I can understand the concept of disincentivizing commercial interests because you're going to limit the number of contracts. But this is getting into, this may be getting into an area that's a little bit obtuse and i'm not sure uh that it's totally necessary so yeah so I'm, I'm surprised you say say that well actually first i guess i disagree with malcolm that the failure has been the complexity i think the failure has been that both sides have been dissatisfied with key pieces of the legislation um it has also been complex which has not helped but i think that it was that both sides viewed the articles as having poison pills in them. Um, but you know, that we should try to keep it as simple as possible. 
But I think if you tell people, okay, if you buy property today, you get X number of rentals. But once you've owned your property for three years or whatever, you can get more. Um, or if you've already owned it for X number of years, you can get more. That creates a huge disincentive to invest because it's not economically profitable for a few years. Um, and I think that that is a great way to encourage people who are part of our community and to discourage people who aren't. Grant. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, I, I, you know, I'm sensitive to this idea that we're creating complexity that that's going to get somebody to stand up at town meeting saying, I don't get this. But I also recognize that if we're putting this in a zoning bylaw um, and it passes, if we want to tweak it down the line, it's going to take another two thirds vote. So Tom, uh, point of order, is it possible for us at the end of this process or two thirds of the way through the process to say, um, these are the things that we value, that we like, that we want to put into some kind of legislation. But these things, like the number of leases, um, go in a general bylaw. And these things, like the um, amount of days someone is on the island or the number of, of licenses they can hold, will stay in the zoning bylaw. That way we can come back at a later town meeting and say, Hey, maybe we want a monkey with number of leases. One thing that uh, occurs to me is that um, if you limit the number of leases, okay, that can be a week, it can be two weeks, it can be three weeks, it can be any number of weeks, but it's one lease. Is that right? Correct. Right. Yes. But I like the term turnovers because that's what we're trying to do. Okay, well, sure. Age of occupancy, you know, mm -hmm. what we know mm -hmm. what we're talking about here. They're synonymous. But um, I think that incentivizes uh, the first time owner, limit to four contracts. That incentivizes long, longer term leases, needless to say, so they can get more money. And it would cut down churn. So, mm -hmm. Um, I, I think I would have some reservations, strong reservations about C, but we can put it in the parking lot and discuss it as you suggested, Grant. Wait, can, can I just ask Charity, can you clarify that? Cause it sounded like you just explained why the concept was a good one because it cuts down on churn. And then you said you'd have reservations about it. So I think I, I would, understand I would that. cut down on any additional rentals. I would not I would not be interested. We would not be interested in increasing the number of rentals that someone can have. Um, so uh, so one of the four that, that we start with. So that's helpful. At this point, uh, unless there's some just really clear justification. Yeah. So so, so, so the so, so Stephen, if I may, the the um you know, one thing that resonated with me in watching work group meeting recordings. Um, and, and I've heard this from people, including from from Jim, is, you know, part of the concern is investor only, and part of the concern is churn. Um, but the thing, the thread that ties those things together is a lack of investment in the community. You don't know your neighbors. And, you know, this idea that you have greater latitude to rent your property by an increase in the number of changes of occupancy after you've owned your home and been a citizen of that neighborhood for three or four or five years, you know, that makes sense to me. Um, it also, um, from an investment standpoint, takes all of the, um, it makes it distasteful, I guess, to, to invest in a property. If you say, well, I'm really not going to be able to get all those. And, and I, but I, I challenge what you said, Charity, you actually get more money per night on a shorter stay. Um, so the longer stays isn't where the money is. Um, so, so from an investment standpoint, it's not as good, even if you rent the same number of days for uh, longer periods. So yeah. I, have there, to, I have to disagree. Uh, I own a, a, a short-term rental in Maine and that's, uh, I'm happy to have people come in for two, three, four weeks. 
And they do have minimal standards and they pay the same thing every week. Yeah, David. well, I mean, I do, I do lots of these here on Nantucket and that is not the case in Nantucket. So it suggests that maybe the market in Maine is different and people like to stay for longer periods of time or they can afford to do it. And that- Or not go outside. Depends on whether it's black fly season or not. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> But I mean, just go staying in two, uh, just saying, oh, I'll stay for two weeks on Nantucket is a uh, very expensive decision uh, that may not be yes. true. In. So uh, well, one thing I also want to point out is you're talking about a situation that really stretches beyond the whole concept of, sec of accessory use in the current zoning bylaw. Because what um, is suggest yeah. people are not, you use the word invest, you came right out of your mouth. And so if that's what people are doing, um, that is probably not going to link up very well with an accessory use. Um, so Terry, uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think that's accurate. And, and I'd like to just spend a, just a minute on why, which is that the, the goal here, um, like the number of turnovers is the best, is one of the best tools that we have because it both limits the disturbance to the neighborhood and it controls the economics of it. It's the, it's the, you know, it's not a magic bullet, but it's pretty close. And if we tell people that for the first three years, just as a placeholder, you can have very few contracts, um, that both reduces the impact on the neighborhood and, and, and makes it an extremely undesirable investment opportunity. And if we tell people once you've owned for three years uh, or whatever the number is, then you can get more. It, 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 I think that that says that people who are part of our community, um, you know, get a get a fair shake uh, at it. Um, it. I just think it's a really good tool that we should be thinking about as a way to both reduce neighborhood impact and discourage investment. Well, there um, you've used the word investment. Okay, so I think we need to differentiate. I said just dis discourage. Yeah. No, you you originally said to encourage you wanted people to people making a decision to invest. Well, every every seasonal homeowner is making an investment. I'd say every primary year-round resident is making right. an investment, choosing to buy and not to rent. I just I just think that C is a um, very uh, unusual proposal. I may have misheard, but I took this investment from the context before as investment in Nantucket in the neighborhood. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah. I think that I think Grant or Jim might have said investing in our community as opposed to economic yeah. investment. But but I would suggest we put this in the parking lot too. I I okay. think I think this is one of those small ones that we may have to, not small, but you know what I mean. Substantial. Yeah. All right. We well, we, to, we talked about it for, for later. Yeah. Okay. You is there a consensus on the shoulder seasons? Well, <laughs> maybe not from charity. But I, I, I think that we're in agreement. The other two groups are in agreement that the shoulder seasons don't need turn uh, turnover limitations. And and I want to add that I hope that we really do consider number of contracts allowed in July and August in a major way because I think that's one of the the best ways we can control STRs in a beneficial way on Nantucket. And what is our what is our general universe of everybody's articles for that? Who suggested is shoulder seasons? No, just July and August. One's nine. Okay. Ours, ours six is six, six turnovers. turnovers. And four, so, so well, we, we we limit the the um, we limit the the uh, minimum number of nights, and we have a an eight, just eight across the board. Yeah, you're at eight for the year, right? Yep, for the year. But we do limit right. one of the ways we address that was through the minimum uh, night stay during July and August. Grant, and that has to be seven. Grant, would you mind if I address that issue? Yeah, please do. Okay, so the, the reason why we talk about number of contracts rather than minimum lengths is we think that it gives the STR owner a bit more flexibility while making sure that most of the... Uh, of, of those rents in the summer will be more than a few days. So if, if someone can only rent six contracts in July and August, okay, so maybe maybe four of them will be for a week, maybe one will be for two weeks, and maybe they have a, a you know a special 
person coming who can only rent three days, they could do that. They have the flexibility to do that while still keeping the minimum stay at a good level. It's probably going to average about a week. But we just think it gives people a bit more flexibility um, rather than saying it must be seven days. Um, but we think it gets to the same effect while just allowing a bit more flexibility for the renter. Um, Jim, I 100% agree with that. But let me just say, where are you guys, Jim and, and Grant, on the number in July and August? Six turnovers. Six. Okay, so so our warrant article says nine, but I think we'd be comfortable with seven, right, Stephen? Yeah, I I think, yeah, certainly it doesn't need to be nine. I think seven would be fine. And, and I think there is a little bit of nuance here. Um, John Giorgio suggested last night that we talk about changes of occupancy, whereas I think our article and, and Jim and Grant, and correct me if I'm wrong, but we're talking, you guys and we are talking in our articles about check-ins or arrivals or contracts. And, and there is a difference. I mean, the change of occupancy would be, um, on, as, as an example, if somebody were to arrive on the 30th of June, that wouldn't count in this definition in our articles. Um, but if there's a change of occupancy on July 1st, that does. Right, so, so I think we just need to think about what that nuance is and clean up the language if we're going to go with John's suggestions. Yeah. But can, I, can I ask a question, um, Steve Mori, about turnovers and changes in occupancy? Would that guard against, a, you know, a couple of families renting for two weeks and one family takes one week and one family takes another week? Yeah, it, it would. Yeah. Yeah, my understanding is change of occupancy would guard against one group rental like happens in the Hamptons where they actually, I think it's a, it's um, something that came out of a limitation or a minimum stay requirement of 32 days in some towns. And so you have people who group together and pool and, you know, rent for 32 days and then they share it. Um, right. But I think if we talk about we don't want that. contracts, then we avoid that. Pitfall. Yeah. You know, so, so between six, seven, and eight, there's a lot of flexibility in terms of us trying to come together with something that we can all agree to. And I, I, I think we're in a good position to do that. Yeah. Again, I agree with that. I think we're we're we're, we're generally in the place where nobody thinks there should be you know, large amounts of turnover during the summer, you know, essentially less than one per week, right? And then I think what Every, everybody's at less than one per week. Yeah. What Steve has mentioned in terms of this uh, essentially bridging one month, um, you know, into the next month to beat the contract thing. I mean, everybody's going to be trying to figure out how to gain this, but I, we should be able, I mean, we're, reasonably smart people, we should be able to figure out how to uh, standardize this either with the minimum night stays or with the turnovers or the number of leases or whatever um, in a way that is good. I mean, it'll work. It's just everybody has to know the rules and so that they're consistent and nobody can really get around them. Yeah. Um, Steve, Steve and, and Warren, did, did, what did John... Georgia say he was recommending going with changes of turnover? Change of occupancy. Change, change of occupancy. Is okay. We have yeah, I, think, I, I, think, I think that's the right concept to yeah. continue to use. Yeah. Okay. Agreed. Um, okay. So we could, I think, move on, Tom. And I think we're in, you know, like we're, we're relatively close, at least on the issue of changes of turnover in the summer. And we have two out of three on on the in the in the July and August, outside of July, but not agreement. Okay, did that did that cover six and seven? Well, and they, no, seven is the uh, number of days. Okay, okay got it. <clears throat> seven limit total number of days leased. Oh, uh, Grant. No, I, I was just exclaiming, but um, oh, if we want to go in order charity, I'm yeah. I'm happy. Okay. No, I mean, when you say okay, limit total number of days lease, we're talking about minimums. Uh, I no, don't... no, 
That's, that's that. aggregate for like the whole year. Oh, I see. Okay. I believe I believe your article has an aggregate total, right? My our article? Yeah. No, it's flexible. It depends okay. on the market, it depends on uh principal use. Well, it, you have a number of days total with a way to get bonuses, right? That's right. Yeah. And it can go up to um 13 weeks, I think it is. Mm -hmm. But if, if I understood your response to David Iverson Monday, oh, yeah. yeah, your article allows for extra days, but not extra turnovers. Now we uh, we do we stick to eight turnovers, right? And so that that would arguably uh, increase the likelihood of a long term rental. Charity, what is the what is the allowance that you have to how do you get the full 13 weeks in your article um you get four just for owning a piece of property if you're on the property for 32 days every every but every property owner it's all done by the law and then for every additional 28 days you get an extra week of short-term rental Every additional 28 days that you occupy the property, you get an, ex an extra week. So your article, if someone does the minimum, they could get 28 days and eight turnovers, right? So they essentially get four weeks, but but could have eight turnovers within that time. And and if they want to get more, then they can, but they can only they could still only get eight turnovers. That's the way we have written it, yes. Okay. I would suggest that that is that's remarkably yeah. complicated. Well, well, people we've shown it to say, well, we like this because what it does is it opens the door for people who may not be short-term renting now to know that they can short-term rent in the future if they want to. Yeah. Um, I guess what I would say is I would not limit the number of days, the aggregate number of days at least at all because I don't think it does anything. I think turnover is what does something yeah and, we're not doing well, so Grant, we agree yep. with that i believe too it's, yes and, and, you know, I, yeah. and i i just want to say i just want to mention why turnovers are such a big deal it's about disrupting the neighborhood it's about the number of landscapers that show up at in your neighborhood it's the number of cleaning Cleaning people. Crews. Yeah. it's but it's also things like the number of trips on the boat if you have if you have more turnover, more more churn, then you've got more cars on the ferry, and and I I think the ferry's in pretty rough shape right now. So, um, anything we can do to sort of create a pressure release valve is a good thing. Yeah. And I, yeah, I don't agree. I don't think that we even discussed um, requiring uh, limiting the total number of days in any context, simply because. The other limits that we're suggesting are are enough. Okay. Um, then the next, I think, is the minimum length uh, issue. Well, we yes, have a minimum in July and August of seven days. And and do you apply? In, and what what about outside July and August? Uh, outside. July and August, it's four days, three nights. And the way we thought about that is some people may not be able to stay three nights. They come, but they have to pay for three nights. Right. Right. Uh, on the uh, minimum length? Um. Our group toyed with the idea of a seven-day minimum in July and August, but we quickly realized that regulating uh, changes of use or changes of, of occupancy was a little bit more effective. And, um, you know, for us, it was, it was just about trying not to punish people who are, who are running these short-term rentals because they have to, because they need to, they need to send their kids to college. They need to, 
you know, pay their crazy mortgages. You, yeah. I mean, no offense, but it's crazy. Um, I don't think anybody's and, offended by that suggestion. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't know if there are any mortgage officers in the, in the room. Um, but uh, so I think our philosophy all along was, what can we do that is the most helpful to the community that's the least punitive against the community? And I think, I think minimum length of stay just creates an inflexibility that it's going to be hard for people to to make their income you know yeah i i would i think our group agrees with that that in the summer you're effectively giving minimum stays through the turnover limitation and it's not economical for people to do short stays but if they want to they should have that flexibility and then in the uh and but if they want to have people who stay for longer um you know we shouldn't necessarily be discouraging that people who stay longer tend to be more invested in the community, um, less have have less of an impact. If you're going to stay for two or three weeks, you're more likely a better, you know, citizen uh, in the community than if you're in than if you feel this pressure to have all your fun uh, in six days, you know. Uh, and then in the off season, I think giving people the chance to enjoy Nantucket on a one or two night stay is good. You know, I think it gives people, you know, we're so expensive here, but getting people, letting people come over for their, you know, daffodil weekend or hunting or whatever, and, and not making it uh, expensive for them is, is, is something is, you know, is a good way to let people enjoy Nantucket. And it's not, I'm not aware of it being really, of those being the problem. Right. How do you think that affects churn? Um, I, I don't because if someone, I don't, I think it's highly unlikely that you've got multiple guests in the same weekend at a, at a house. Um, you know, I think that someone comes and leaves for two nights or four nights, you know, I, there's, there's, I have to imagine there's extremely few places that are doing like one night turnovers and, but have back to back reservations that, I'm not, Stephen Moore, are you aware of, you know, that as a practice? It's got to be very minimal. Tell. Yeah, kind not, of not with brokered rentals. So I'm not aware of that. I mean, and, you know. uh, and I just want to say if, if someone does use one of their six uh, changes of occupancy for two, two day rentals, there will be a number of days that either won't be rented and will be quiet for the neighborhood or will be a longer term renter. So yeah. it, I think it, it it's self-protecting. That's what I like about it. Yeah. Well, we, but what about in? So you're saying even in the summertime, there's no minimum. Is that what you're suggesting? Right. That the minimum is defined by only let's say six changes of occupancy, which will average out to about a week or maybe a little longer than a week. But if someone does a few short ones, okay, then the the uh, SGR will probably be unoccupied for a while, or we'll have someone there for three weeks to make up the difference. But it, it just gives the renter a little more flexibility while still preserving uh, protecting the neighborhood. Yeah. And there are people who, as a practice, do short rentals in the summer. And I don't think we want to make those uh, illegal. You know, if people want to rent their place for a few days because that's what works for their situation. Um, but they still have the same number of turnovers. I think that's probably fine. Sure. Yeah. Stephen, um, what what is the usual um, rental? For example, is it Saturday to Saturday, or is it Sunday to Sunday, or is it Wednesday to Wednesday? When we rent, it was Saturday to Saturday. Uh, yeah, that's, that's that's customary. Saturday to Saturday. Saturday to Saturday. In, in a way, in a way, if that were staggered more you would probably not have as much churn you would not have the frenzy on saturdays and sunday or whatever saturdays of the turnover um and there wouldn't be the burden on the uh ferries as much everybody trying to get on them and off the ferry the same day i was i have to tell you the story i was listening to some people on the ferry and they were trying to figure out so, uh something about a wedding and the ferry was canceled and the renter called the, or the rentee called the rentor and said, we can't leave because uh, the ferry's canceled and the rent 
door said, you're out of the house. I've got other people coming in at five o'clock. Mm. And Charity, I want to say that I agree with you about tr tr trying, if possible, to make it so that not all the turnovers are on a Saturday, but doing it by change of occupancy actually helps that because someone could rent to one group for 10 days. They leave in, in Wednesday. Then the next group could come in for four days or whatever. In other words, you, you the math works out for a little more irregularity. And you yeah. It encourages it. Yeah. I agree too. Jim, Jim, would you agree that this was something that we talked about at length at the short term on a work group and decided that that this was the best way to do it as opposed to other ways of limiting? I would agree and I would underscore at length. <laughs> okay, so the primary thing that we're going to focus on is turnovers or changes of occupancy. Sound, sounds like it. Um but that goes into the parking lot now too, right? Sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. What's that, Stephen? It's a crowded parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's not a it's not a parking garage though, is it, Grant? Thank goodness. Uh huh. <laughs> it's amazing what we spend uh, time and time meeting on. Oh, I'm bringing that one back, man. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so we're we at number eight. Yes. No, nine. Well, nine. nine. We just did eight, didn't oh, we? Yeah. Yeah. Nine. Oh. Require non STR occupancy charity. Is this principal use? So I, I think what we heard from John Giorgio is that you can't require owner occupation, but that you can require, um, non-str use right and i don't know i think um someone from kp law is on but i think that's where the advice i heard that if you want to require minimum use you can't actually say it has to be the owner hi um but we I'm didn't happy, hear that i'm happy to uh step in just under the dormant dormant commerce clause um provision and as a follow-up to i think there was a question Yesterday, this kind of tied into West Tisbury's um, prong in which they tried to have, they enacted a bylaw that had some sort of residency requirement to be able to short term rent. And that hasn't been approved or disapproved by the Attorney General yet. There's no decision on that. So, um, stay tuned. Um, but even, even if it is, it's town council's opinion that um, the attorney general's review is usually pretty limited to whether something conflicts with state law or the state constitution. So even if she flags things under the dormant commerce clause in um, her analysis and ultimately ends up approving some sort of residency requirement for short term rentals or owner occupied requirement, um, it would not necessarily insulate the town from, from litigation in federal court. So we just caution that. Um, but with that said, there's a number of, of cases the Fifth Circuit has said, no, you can't have an owner, owner a primary residency requirement. Um, I know one of the proposals has something like, you just have to have some sort of tie, I know from the Mr. Sam, some sort of tie to the community, like you would be there for 30 days. Uh, whether that's consecutive or non-consecutive in order to um, qualify. And town council's position is that the most sort of conservative middle ground to balance between these dormant commerce clause challenges and um, and wanting to have some sort of obvious connection to the community is to include some sort of language that's either, you know, it's either the owner or a host or a tenant or someone with, you know, these these sufficient the 30 day connection type thing might be somewhat defensible. Um, and that is, yeah, happy to take any further questions or clarify sort of where the Commerce Clause analysis comes in uh, to specific proposals, but that's their general overview. Thank you, Devin. Jim. Yes. Yeah, so um, thank you. And we will take that advice. Absolutely. Um, and I do want to just update you on what I said about Palm Springs yesterday, where I said they, they've had the 30 day residency and it seems to be okay. Well, I called them today. I talked to them. Mm -hmm. They have dropped the 30 day residency, but not because of the dormant commerce clause. They dropped it because they said it was absolutely impossible to enforce. They said maybe a bit facetiously, but the enforcement officer said the only way we could enforce it was by making people wear ankle bracelets. 
and he, he and he, it, was, it was a bit of humor but in other words it's it's almost impossible to enforce which brings up these concerns and how enforceable are they um it's something we need to discuss at length i think but the concept of a connection to the island is very important to our group and i think it's important to all of us and so if we can find some way with town council and with with everyone else here to uh somehow encourage that i think that would be to the benefit of all of us yeah and i think that's a really good point um enforcement was something that john Burke and i had discussed when we when we were looking at this and at least in the it, it looks like other communities in which their ordinances have been or bylaws have been struck down um tried to have the enforcement mechanism be by some sort of property tax exemption or a homestead exemption claim um and those didn't didn't pass muster because it you know was sort of a primary residency requirement um so it's it's a consideration that's certainly worth further discussion Grant? um you know what what jim says is 100 percent true our group is really concerned about requiring somehow that people have a connection to the community that they go to the stop and shop that they learn the name of the person that cuts their hair that the, you know and and those seem trivial but but you know i've thought for three decades that the one thing that was wrong about this island was that some people come here not knowing anything about the island and they and they treat it like anywhere else and it's not anywhere else it's special um, so, but the question I have for you, Devin, is would it be possible to create a residency requirement only for new licenses, not for everyone? Um, it, dep I, it depends. It's doubtful. I mean, the Fifth Circuit said, you know, you're clearly favoring sort of in-state interests at the expense of out-of-staters or new businesses that you know have the right to enter the short-term market rental on equal terms um if you wanted to come up with this sort of a 30-day type limit or something um it wouldn't be more likely to be defensible we've, we've we know for a fact of an owner sort of a primary residency requirement is is unconstitutional at least in the fifth circuit um, a 270 day requirement was also sort of struck down. Um, mm -hmm. but somewhere in between that, where it's like sufficient connections, you know, 30 days or, or more, um, you could certainly make the argument or try to make the argument. And again, this, this is, it, it is a really evolving area of law. The fifth circuit has been pretty clear, but the ninth circuit has gone another way. Um, the first circuit where Obviously, Massachusetts is hasn't addressed it, so um, it's evolving. It's your first impression, certainly, and if challenged, we'll make we'll make our best arguments in a way that's fair. Um, so, Devin, I appreciate that the this is like the stickiest Steve, wicket legally. Stephen, oh. may, may I just go in order? Just absolutely. To I'm sorry. Okay, no. thank you, Charity. Um, our article recognizes the problem with the Commerce Clause. And we refer to the lot and we refer to residential use mm -hmm. and we do not prescribe uh, anything about the owner. And it is designed to, uh, as I said before, to encourage long-term rentals or the owner uh, or the person who is the operator or who lives in the house to be able to use the time that they're there as a down payment on the number of days that they can rent. So a certain, and, and I agree that the fifth circuit is not the first circuit. And, um, and I think that the test is going to be with West Tisbury, but if you're talking about an accessory use, you have to accessory use to principal use, you have to have some kind of a uh, provision of uh, allowance for a certain number of days compared to the principal use. That's the zoning bylaw we have now. 
And I think that that is, um, I think what you're getting at at this number of days by whom for how long. Steven? So, yeah. So um, my group is relatively strongly against this occupancy requirement for a number of reasons. Uh, one of them is the constitutional issues. One of them is the uh, safety issues and the complexity of tracking and reporting how many nights you're you're staying in a place. Uh, the idea of, of reporting to the government how many nights I sleep in, in my house, uh, it seems both invasive and unsafe. Um, however, the concept does have some legs. You know, frankly, after talking to Jim and um, Grant, I, I see their point that wanting to have someone who's invested in the community um, as a way to really mitigate nuisances and, and other problems uh, has a lot of value. And so the idea that I had is that perhaps we could have some requirement um, that you that there has to be some non-STR use. And, and that doesn't necessarily have to be a number of days because if it's used by the owner, um, if it's not a rental, then it then it doesn't have if it was a rental it would have to be for more than 30 days or 31 days by definition but if it's used by the owner then i don't or, or guests of the owner then i don't know that we necessarily need to to regulate that as much because that's really the person who's invested right um it's not it's not a tenant at all um and so i'm i'm less inclined to look at the number of days when it's the owner and more inclined to look at the number of days sort of by definition when it's when it's a lease, it would have to be 32 days or more. Um, and, but I also think I would tie that to people who have owned the home for less than three years or something like that. And, and what I mean by that is that if you've already owned your home for more than three years, you are already a member of our community, right? You are not an, likely an investor. Um, and so if you're going and buying the property, you are now you know, either a new visitor or a new member of our community or a new investor. And so having that requirement for, for new people, um, not not new STRs, but new property owners, um, I think I think is a is a again a huge disincentive to investor only STRs and is a good way to 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 and it and it would not actually be a problem for 95% of people. If most people um, either are, are buying these homes and you said you have to have some S non STR use, most people are fine with that because that's why they're buying houses here in the first place there's not a lot of people who don't come to nantucket don't know anything about nantucket but want to buy a house here it's kind of a myth uh frankly in my opinion um the other thing is that i can think of a number of situations that are relatively common that where nobody lives in the house that we don't actually object to and what i mean by that is properties that are there are family properties that are inherited um and used as short-term rentals but no one lives them in the, in the off season I don't know that we want to try to force that. Um, uh, the second one is people who um, retire to warmer clients, but uh, climates, but want to um, keep their home as as their retirement income instead of selling it. Relatively common, uh, or people who need to move into either the island home or somewhere off island for health reasons, whether that's temporary or permanent. Uh, oftentimes, those homes are kept as income streams uh but they are not um uh the, but the, but they're not ever lived in uh, off season and again those are people generally who have already lived here maybe their whole lives or for a long time you know those are not people those people are part of our community and that's why i wouldn't put i wouldn't want to put an extra burden on them that we're trying to put on making it more difficult for people who are who just see the piggy bank mr peel Thank you. Uh, so I've been quiet tonight, but I think Charity's been doing a wonderful job uh, kind of stating our position on everything. Um, you know, I kind of disagree with Stephen a little bit uh, as far as it should be required for everyone, not, you know, including the legacies on island, uh, you know, whether they are or not part of the communities, mainly because uh, I think one of the biggest deterrents for investors is going to be you know, that people won't use these houses anything longer than 14, what is it, 14 days, I believe it is. And then they can uh, write everything off as basically a business. 
um, if they have less of use less than 14 days. And so I think that's a huge deterrent, especially for current investor owned um, on island as well. And my second question to maybe to town council is as far as do we know what Charleston is doing? Because I know Charleston is requiring actually, you know, they're requiring use of the property and they're actually requiring the owner to be present in the property during a short-term rental. And I wasn't sure if, if you've seen anything on what Charleston or if there's anything going on with Charleston right now. Uh, I haven't seen that recently, but um, the the requiring the owner to be present is that, that type of language that's been deemed problematic by a couple of courts where it has been okayed in some circumstances, such as like San Diego and um, I think Lake Tahoe or a couple of other California courts that, that dealt with the issue was if you said the owner has to be present, but it doesn't need to be the owner. It could be like a host or an operator or a long-term tenant or someone, you know, someone with connections to the community, a property manager or something like that. Um, so that's not the owner language, which is sort of the problem of discriminating against out-of-state owners. Grant. Um, I like what Stephen was saying about uh, three years, like if you've owned the property for three years and then and then after three years, it goes away. Um, <clears throat> so I can agree to that in principle. Uh, it's the the tough thing is things like, allowing your family members to use it and that satisfies the requirement or allowing you know your golf buddies to come by and, and use the property for 28 days because you need to do it not, the idea is to get somebody to become part of the community or to understand what the community is all about and um you know i would i would make it a week's worth of uh worth of requirement if if they would come in the dead of february you know, just I, I want people to know what the island is like. It's nice in February, Grant. It's March. It's well, it, it is now. It is now. Um, thank you, global warming. But you know that I I I don't know if we can work the details out on this one. But I think getting into giving people lots of little loopholes to satisfy re that requirement is kind of a kind of anti. It's it's it works cross purposes with what we're trying to do. Yeah, if I may, for charity, uh, I think we need to think about enforcement for the for this entire a la Jim's comment about um, talking to Palm Springs. I sort of just can I just, can I just talk about enforcement for a moment? Yes. Um, so, you know, Jim was saying that they can't enforce it in Palm Springs, but the the reason we liked the idea, even though it is very difficult to enforce was because it becomes something that you can enforce after there is a noise violation or another infraction, or you know somebody has not followed all the rules, and then you can go to them and say, "Let's see your let's see uh, your boat tickets to show that you were here for thirty days." I'm not saying that we get neighbors spying on neighbors because that's just not it's just not the kind of community we want, but but it's just another tool. And it's just another deterrent to somebody who, you know, they have $20 million to spend and they want to buy five houses and they want to create short-term rentals with they, they to spend 30 days in each of those five houses, then the deal's off, you know? I, I think Stephen did bring up a point. Stephen Cohen brought up a good point before about who is going to hold that data and, and what that leads to. I think I would just put a pin in that for later as we think about this, because um, I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, so w w one one thing I would even go ahead. I think yeah, charity might have been first. Okay, yeah. charity. I think that the IRS has the data, and I brought this up yesterday. Um, as somebody who owns a short-term rental, you have to report on Schedule E your rental days and your personal days, and. Um, if you don't, then you run the risk of an audit. And what's what I'm concerned about here is that people aren't uh, following that uh, requirement. Now, 
so you have a lot of gaming going on. But I think, and every, you know, you can have somebody say, well, you can go and stay in my house as my guest, and I'll go and stay in your house as your guest, and we'll all get 30 days. Yeah, I don't want that. Yeah. But and, and well, that's what for you don't want. But, but the other thing you have to think about, and one of the purposes of our article, is to reassure the people who do rent in the Nantucket tradition here, local people are going to be incentivized to do some long-term rentals and in turn for that, they can get extra short-term weeks if they want them, if and even if they don't. But they everybody starts off with a base. And for people who are year-round residents, this article is very, very um, agreeable from what I have heard to them. David? Um, so I, I, the I others, think this David? occupancy- Real quick. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, were, you were first, yep. The occupancy requirements, um, if you're really trying to say that, you know, vacation rent home renters, second home renters can't leave their house empty and now need to come here a certain number of days. That's not typically the tradition that we've had. And uh, I'm hesitant to get into a situation where we are um, creating invasiveness and safety issues and unenforceability and all kinds of things. But uh, we're also creating a, an economic incentive for housing insecurity and an economic incentive for loopholes you know if, if i can make x amount of dollars over the summer and all i need to do is pay someone to stay at my house or let someone stay at my house for for two bucks for for 30 days uh you know you better believe there's going to be ads in the paper i'll sleep at your house for for two grand for five grand for 30 days it's going to be a new off-season job to sleep in people's houses so they can get str weeks it just yeah i don't want I, that i don't i don't it just seems super problematic and and the the goal of it can be addressed by other things, depending on what your goal is. If your goal is to force people to use the properties, then that's illegal under the Commerce Clause. If your goal is to discourage investor-focused um, STRs, I think there are much better tools than, that we've talked about that do that. So uh, I. I just, I mean, we could put a pin in this one like we are all the other ones, but um, I think this is the most divisive um, and potentially problematic rule. Um, the other thing that that I don't like about it is that it it will hyper focus STRs in year round neighborhoods, and because those are the people who will qualify because they they meet it. Whereas all these empty summer houses will have much less SDRs because they were empty most of the time, so they don't qualify for it. So, you know, the unintended consequence is that the, the summer homes are most, will be more empty and the and the year-round houses are will have the, you know, like the tokens that they could sell. Um, it, it just, it the implement, the concept of we want to have accessory use, I think is fine, but the implementation of it sometimes is just really problematic. Um, and I think that this one is uh, uh, hairy, to say the least. Well, we disagree, but that's that's why we're here. Sure. Jim? Yes, just to sum up, there will be enforcement problems. There may be commerce problems. But I do think one sort of ramp onto it that we found was maybe just a three-year term that might be more legal, might not um, interfere with the Commerce Clause, and might do what Grant and I are talking about, which is um, try to make sure that there's more of a Nantucket connection. So I'd, I'd just like us to keep that in mind for the future. Yeah. Uh, and, but just to piggyback that, I'd love to find a way to have something that we could do that's temporary, that that, that discourages investor-focused STRs, because if you can get it in there, it just makes financing those that much tougher, right? So you, your right. enforcement isn't really your issue. Your discouragement is your is your issue. Uh, so you know, if you're if if we can do it in a in a light way that discourages investors, there's at least some win there. So I think we should talk about it. 
Yeah, Devin, let's talk is about that, it. Is that something that you can talk to John about and sort of come up with maybe a universe of ideas around that, perhaps around this conversation, please? Certainly. Thank you. All right, five minute warning <laughs> before 8 p.m. Um, do we wanna do we wanna go into 10 quickly and kind yeah. of tackle that until eight and then yeah, uh, adjourn for the evening and we'll pick back up on Thursday? Yeah. You bet. Oh, I think okay. we can quickly go through the rest. I don't think they're that controversial. Okay. Well, uh, charity on number 10. Can I, you zoom down a little? I think we prohibit STRs in all tertiary dwellings and all inclusionary housing. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Agree. Great, done. <laughs> Pull that one out of the parking lot. We got something. Are you keeping score, Stephen? Thank you. Yeah, great. Required compliance with everyone. One out agree? of 10 Simple. that didn't end up in the parking lot? Okay. Well, parts of, parts of them. I think we found there's a bit of consensus on some of the on some of the middle provisions in this Agreed. list. Yeah. Matt has his hand up. Yes, Matt. Yeah, so, sorry for my ignorance, but what what's the definition of inclusionary housing as far as Yeah, that's like, like park circle type thing or No, I I can answer that. It it's um essentially workforce housing created through MCD permits that is not subject to the primary secondary housing rules. So like dorms. What's yeah, em em employee housing units that are exempt from the primary secondary rules. We don't want STRs there. I don't now, what do we, now, what do we think about, I guess, uh, townhouses, condos, that kind of thing? I know that was on the, I believe that was in the short-term rental uh, um, article. That it would exclude was it townhouses or condos? Yeah, and park circle? I never understood why. So I'm I, I'm going to say my ignorance on on townhouses. Yeah, a lot of those we I if I remember back to the conversation, a lot of those are deed restricted anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, but exactly why we put that in there, I, I, it was a while ago, and a lot of short term rental stuff has happened since then. Um, mm -hmm. So I I will I will get the answer to that. Well, from what I remember, I think it was more to encourage that as more workforce year-round housing, um, whether yes. a rental or, you know, that's kind of brings, because most of those places are in a price point for, for you know, just the average worker or school teacher, that kind of stuff, even though they're, you know, going for a million or 1.2 or 1.6 or whatever. But, you know, some, you know, there's high wages out here too. So yeah. it's, a little more attainable than a single family home. Um, now, I don't know how the rest of you feel about it, but I would be willing to entertain something like that, you know, either condos or townhouses, just to kind of keep that. I don't know how many are out there. I know there's a few in Park Circle. Uh, and I don't mean to exclude, you know, single them out by any means. It's just, you know, the first one that pops into my mind. Um, but I also, again, think it's a way to uh, kind of keep and encourage and keep houses at a price point that that are obtainable for people on this island. Yeah, I think those are valid concerns, Matt. And I remember John, John with the STRWG going over this at length. And I think we just need to go back to it with him and say yeah. why, what, what was the, what was the chronology of how that happened? Um, Eleven, uh, quickly. Go ahead. Charity? Okay. okay. I think we all agree on 11, yep. right? Compliance with 11 is good. Yeah, it's kind of necessary. Yeah. And then 12, these are I things that I 11 can... require compliance with 123, whatever it is. The 123 is the Board of Health rules. Yeah. But I mean, we've got some amendment, we've got some bylaws for that. Right. But just as a concept. Yep. <clears throat> yep. Okay any flags in 12 or a placeholder for discussion on Thursday before we adjourn? Yes, Grant. My only, <clears throat> I like a lot of the stuff that's in 12. And I think that they, that a lot of them should be separate additions to the general bylaw. I just, the, the only thing I worry about is adding stuff, tacking it on. It feels a little pork like to me 
Um, and if we want something that's easy to talk about at town meeting and easy to get across to the, the average voter, then maybe not adding complexity um, is a good idea. So Grant, I, I agree with that. And obviously I drafted those. And, and I I think that this, if people are in favor of those but are worried about complexity, maybe they could either slide to a separate article or to a different town meeting. We don't we don't need to do everything on day one or in the same article. OK, um, should we hold should we hold that until the general bylaw discussion sort of general? Sure. OK, I love that idea. OK, Great. and 13, I think effective date would we can talk about that on Thursday. Sure. Um, unless anybody has any. I don't have any opinion on it. I think Stephen had a really good rationale for his effective date. OK, I think I think we would take counsel from. John and Devin on that and okay. whatever the attorney general and that we went through a process with that at ST, STRWG. Um, thank so, you all. Wait, yes, Tom, please. before, I, yep. I, I do want to note, there's very few things that we disagree strongly on and a lot of things where we're in a decent window on, I feel good that we're making progress, even though obviously there's no consensus. I agree. Um, well, we have minutes that will identify the um, parking lot issues. Yes, in some form, this will all. I, I need to. I I need to kind of um, have a confab on uh, with with other folks who are who are in town admin on on how that's going to work. Um, really I may have already received minutes. I I just haven't looked at my email, so um, I, I will I will get back to you, or or one of us will get back to you. But we need that Great. before Thursday. Okay. Understand. Understood. All right. Understood. Uh, yeah. in, in, yes, oh, Matt. Quickly. Sorry, Tom. Yeah, uh, I, that was. I was just going to kind of piggyback on what Charity said, and you know, I think really for this kind of work out, maybe on Thursday. I don't know if we can designate somebody or we get a volunteer or something. There, kind of, my hand, my seven-year-old has better handwriting than I do, or else I'd volunteer. But you know, maybe grab a whiteboard and start writing these things out, and you know, kind of getting in. I think it kind of could get some old school workshop going here as far as these ideas. I think is going to be the the best way forward. So just something to think about for procedure-wise for Thursday, since we'll all be in person. So, and no, you no. just use newsprint and put it up on the walls if you want to. I mean, that's a real workshop, but then you've, you've invited public comment. So that's gonna make it very difficult for us to keep going on this. Okay, well, it, we'll, it, we, it will, we, will, that we, we will start again. We will start anew on Thursday. Uh, and I, with that, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. So moved. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Ayes have it. Unanimously, thank you very much, everyone. Appreciate your time. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.